in the early 1990s, um, I was very sick. I was in a hospital. I had liver and kidney failure. Um, I was at the time an atheist. I was a college student. Um, I was very unhappy, always very unhappy. I had no spirituality. I believed in nothing. I learned to a large extent how to control my desires and how to control my thinking um, because of my time with Swami. Every single day with Swami was like a gift. I learned how to interact with God on a day-to-day -day basis. I learned how to um, be a solid person in the world. During that time, he kept going past me in his wheelchair and he wouldn't talk to me, but he kept dripping sweat on me. I know it sounds very strange, but Swami would come and lean over me and sweat would, he would like take a letter from someone and sweat would drip on my face. You know, I, I felt it was always this game, like I'm so close to Swami and then he would keep me really far away. So close to Swami, but you're forbidden from entering the ashram. During that time, every night I had this dream that I was standing at the Ganesh gate with my suitcase and the guards had a photo of me in the guard booth that's, and it said, do not admit <laughs> my photo. So it's always, it's always been this experience. I've come really close, but you know, go away now. And um, how much suffering that induced in me. I have no idea what my karma is that required that. I wrote a, a very impassioned appeal to Swami um, asking for permission to stay permanently and to have my job converted to permanent staff and uh, to have a room in the ashram permanently. And um, I gave it, I gave the letter with my passport in Darshan. And uh, a few days later, I came back to my room and there was a lock on the door and with a note to report to Mr. Unikrishnan. So I went to Unikrishnan and he said, you have to leave the ashram immediately and don't ever come back, you're being blacklisted. Indian holy man Sri Satya Sai Baba continues to be Brian Brunius' teacher on many levels. This public talk is a follow-up to where Brian left off with his most compelling Sojourns interview back in January of 2010. Thanks to the Manhattan Sai Center for making this video available. Welcome to Sojourns. This talk was recorded on March 14, 2013, in New York City. Well, Cyril, I'm so scared about um, being here tonight because I have no idea what to say. Um, so I just keep, I just keep praying for Swami to speak through me. Um, so I'll start from the beginning since I don't know where else to start, and I'll say that. Um, in the early 90s. Sure. In the early 1990s, um, I was very sick. I was in a hospital. I had liver and kidney failure. Um, I was at the time an atheist. I was a college student. Um, I was very unhappy, always very unhappy. I had no spirituality. I believed in nothing. Um, except that I, I thought I knew everything and that I was the center of the universe. And, um, and uh, I was in a hospital room getting more and more sick um, on regular dialysis. And um, what happened is that one night somebody came to visit me in the hospital room, um, someone I didn't know who was making a compassionate visit. And um, just before he left that night, from his visit, he said to me, one day, one day you may be desperate enough to reach out for help. And I know you don't believe in God, but I want you to know that there is a kind and a loving and a benevolent force in the universe. And if you reach out to it and ask for help, it will reach back and help you, no matter what you believe. And um, that night, as I lay in the hospital bed, um, I suddenly realized that I was floating above my body, looking down at myself. Um, and I desperately tried to move, to reach for help, um, to ring the buzzer for the nurse, and I found that I was completely still and motionless. And um, in that moment of desperate struggle, I suddenly realized that a, a huge feeling of peace came over me, and the thought came to me, you're dying. And in that moment, I had a vision in which I reviewed all of my life up to that point, in which I saw the faces of all the people I'd known, and I saw a lot of experiences that had happened to me. And none of them were good. None of them were happy. Um, none of them were resolved. And at that moment, I thought, well, this guy said, the last thing in my, in my review of my life was this guy leaving my room, saying to me, one day when you're desperate enough to reach out for help, it will be there. 
So at that moment, I prayed for the first time in my life. And I, I said, God, I know you're not really there, but just in case you can hear me, I need help, and I'm willing to do whatever it takes. Um, and at that moment, the sky above me opened and a beautiful blue light came down around me um, and lifted me up. And I had an experience. Um, I don't know what you call it, but I had a beautiful experience. And when I woke up in the hospital room the next day, um, I was healthy. The doctors were amazed. They didn't know what to do. They ran all the tests, and in two days they let me go. Um, and uh, it, it seems that I woke up the next day a different person because all of my interests had changed, all of my desires had changed, my whole view on life and the world had changed, and um, uh, everything changed. Um, within, a, within a few months, I moved to New York. I had been living in the West Coast, and um, uh, I started having these strange spiritual experiences, and in one of them I felt I felt like God was telling me to move to New York. So I picked up out of the blue, packed my bags, and got on a train and came to New York. And um, very shortly after arriving in New York, I started having dreams um, every night about this funny uh, guy. I thought he was African um, with a big afro. And um, um, in my dreams, I was a detective investigating a murder. And I was going through a house room by room, opening every cupboard, looking in every drawer. And every cupboard I opened had a very particular photo of Swami in it. And every drawer I opened had the same photo. And all through the house there was broken glass, the furniture was turned over, but everywhere I went I kept seeing pictures of Swami. And blood and everything broken and lots of blood. It was a murder scene. It was my murder. And. Um, Finally, in the last room of the house I came to, it was a bedroom, and the bedroom had a long, low dressing table, and over it was a big mirror. And right in the center of the mirror was the same photo of Swami I'd seen everywhere in the house. And the whole top of the dresser was covered in ashes, and um, the ashes were falling from the photo. And as if with a finger, somebody had written in the ashes a phone number. Um, and. Uh, I had that dream every night for three months, um, sometimes many times a night, three, four, five, six, seven times a night, the same dream over and over again. It would always start at the beginning and end at the end. And I was going crazy not knowing why I was having this dream. This was the early 90s. There weren't a lot of people um, who knew about Swami. There weren't, the internet didn't really exist then. You couldn't just go and search for things and find <laughs> uh, everything in the world. And, um, and I thought he was African, so I was asking people about Africa. And um, I, was on the wrong, I was on the wrong road. And finally somebody was saying to me, no, you've got to keep a pen by your bed and try to write down the number. So every night when I'd have the dream, I'd wake up and try to write a few numbers. And finally, after about a week of trying that, I had something that looked like a phone number. It was a 516 number. And um, finally one morning I got up the courage and I dialed the number. And I said to the person who answered, I'm so sorry, I hope I'm not bothering you. This may sound strange, but I saw your phone number in a dream. <laughs> and the guy who answered said, oh no, not at all. That's, uh, I hear strange things all the time. Why don't you tell me? <laughs> tell me what it is you saw in your dream. And I said, well, I saw a black guy with a big afro wearing an orange dress. And he said, oh yeah, no, that's my spiritual teacher. His name is Sai Baba. He's not African, he's from India. And we have a group that meets every week, um, twice a week then, um, and why don't you come? Obviously you're, you're being called. Now at that time I'd also been praying for a teacher um, to help guide me on my spiritual path. I'd had this kind of awakening, but I really didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know how to practice a kind of daily spirituality. I didn't know what it meant to be in regular communication with God. And um, um, yeah, I didn't really know how to live. And um, so I came, I, I, I said, okay, I'll come. He gave me the address. It was a church on, I forget, Amsterdam or Columbus. Richard, where was it? 72nd in Columbus or 70? Before that. Big church with a little, with red doors. So, uh, so, uh, 
I, I thought, okay, fine, I'll go there tonight. So I left, I was wearing shorts and a t-shirt, it was warm. And uh, I left my house and I, I was walking down the street and um, I was walking past a bookstore. And the bookstore had these cheap $1 books on the sidewalk that nobody wanted to buy. And um, the first book I saw was called Language of the Heart and it had a photo of Swami on the front. And when I turned it over, it had the photo that was in my dream every night. Um, and uh, so I bought the book and I thought, oh, well, good, I'll read it um, before I go to this meeting. So I got on the subway I lived in Brooklyn at the time, and on the subway, it was very crowded and people were holding all the poles, and I was standing holding a pole and suddenly realized that somebody was facing me, and on their finger, they had a ring, and the ring had the exact same photo that I'd seen in my dream, and that was on the book. <laughs> and I was thinking, this is very interesting, I've known nothing for three months, and suddenly I keep seeing the same photo. So uh, I arrived at the center, and... Um, uh, I walked through the door and somebody started chasing me down. No, 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 you can't wear shorts here. You have to leave. And um, um, we were very modest then. And, uh, but the person I had called on the phone was waiting for me and he was at the time the um, membership coordinator for the center. And um, he somehow convinced them. He, he grabbed a scarf from some lady and wrapped it around me like a <laughs> dress <laughs> and said, he can come in like this. And... Uh, so I came in for the bhajan, and um, I had the strangest experience that night of knowing the words of every bhajan, even though I'd never heard any of them before. And, um, um, you know, it was, just, it was the beginning of my journey with Swami. I started working on the Sai Sarathi newsletter, I think the next week, and um, got very involved in the center. And it was only a very short time later that we uh, all flew to India for Swami's birthday. And... Um, I'm leaving out so much, but it doesn't really matter because this is really an inward journey. So the outside details don't matter that much. Um, but what happened is that we all went to India together in a big airplane. We filled <laughs> most of an airplane and um, uh, I got a free ticket. Uh, I don't know how because I had no money and, um, um, and a six month visa. And um, we got to the ashram in the afternoon, just before afternoon darshan. And suddenly they were ringing a bell and everyone said, oh my God, we've got to leave our suitcases and go for darshan. And we all ran. And the um, Sai Kuan Hall was completely full. Of course, they were pushing people in through the back door and um, through the main gate. And um, there were a million people already sitting. There was no way we were going to get anywhere near the front. And I got my first experience of the Seva doll, um, who one grabbed me by my arm and said, come over here. And, pushed me against the wall and the other one grabbed my arm and said, no, you come over here. And you, another one grabbed me and about 20 it all grabbed me and pushed me around and told me where to go. And by the time I was done, I was sitting in the front row. <laughs> um, <laughs> they'd like made everyone squish away and made a room, big space for me, big space. And um, sitting on a hard stone floor for the first time, cross-legged. Um, and uh, I thought it was, you know, an important day, right? So I was wearing like a, a coat and a tie and... <laughs> It was a big event for me going to India to meet this guy who'd come in my dreams. And um, they sat me right in the front row. And um, you, you all, most of you know there's a, a white marble walkway which would go from Swami's room uh, on the back of the Purnachandra in, in front of his house when they built the house um, through the darshan area, the path he would follow. And they sent me right at the end of that long white path. And um, just as I sat down, music started playing. And I saw Swami step out of his house onto that white marble path. And, um, you know, it was one day or two days before birthday, it was immensely crowded. There were so many people. And um, I don't know what really happened that day, but what I saw in my mind was that um, Swami walked from his house straight to me the entire way without looking at anyone else, without talking to anyone else, without taking anything from anyone. He walked straight to me, all the way through the ladies' side, all the way to the men's side, straight up to me. And when he walked up to me, he looked down at me and said, Brian, I gave you the dream for three months. What took you so long? Um, and uh, I was, you know how it is with Swami, you can't speak when he talks to you. Um, I mean, I can't. I can never speak when Swami talks to me. I'm uh, dumbfounded. And, um, and he said, do you know the difference between you and me? And I, I don't think, I want to say I said no, but I don't think I said anything. I don't think I could talk. And he said, the only difference between you and me is that I know I'm God. 
and you don't yet know that you're also God, and so is everyone and everything. He, of course, he said it in his words, but that's what I remember. And, um, and he walked away, and he was already 30 feet away from me before I even realized where I was or what was happening. And um, what happened is that within, within a matter of a few weeks, um, I'd been given a job in the ashram, um, the kind of job that foreigners can have there, not as a permanent resident. And, um, and, uh, and I ended up staying for almost three years. Um, and uh, I was just so overwhelmed by Swami. Um, <laughs> just so overwhelmed. And my job required me to have a front row seat every day because I had to take big piles of vibhuti packets to get blessed. And um, so every day I was in the front row holding up a plate of vibhuti packets for Swami to bless and um, uh, the big yellow ones that they used to make, or maybe they still do. And um, so virtually every day Swami would come to me and bless the vibhuti because it, was, you know, it wasn't for me. And um, as he, he would walk up to me, he would put his, he would put his toes right under the, the front of my um, uh, knees and like tickle my knees with his toes. Nobody else could see his, his you know, kurta would be hanging there. And um, it would just felt so beautiful and so intimate. You know, I was this absolute stranger. And uh, I felt like I got so much attention. You know, it's not like he talked to me every day, but he gave me something every day. Every single day with Swami was like a gift. And, um, and the principles I learned in the Sai organization, um, and living in Prashanti really became the foundations for my daily way of living. My, uh, I learned how to interact with God on a day-to-day -day basis. I learned how to um, be a solid person in the world. Um, I, I learned to a large extent how to control my desires and how to control my thinking um, because of my time with Swami. And I'll tell you some stories about that. Um, so the first, the first lesson I got from Swami, which many of you already know, um, but it, it repeats about three or four times, is that after um, a certain amount of time had passed, maybe six months, um, one day in Darshan, Swami said something about me to the people sitting around me who were all, I, I sat with the college professors for whatever reason, and they really didn't like having this young white kid from America sitting with them every day. Um, but uh, I sat with them every day, and Swami said something to them one day about me in, in a language I couldn't understand, maybe Telugu, and all the people moved away from me. They just, everyone moved away from me so far. And um, um, I have no idea even now what Swami said, but the effect of it was that when I went back to my job, I was told that I couldn't work there anymore. And the next day when I tried to go back to Darshan, they turned me away from the, the gate I usually entered through. And um, uh, my private room got taken away and I was put in a shed. And <laughs> um, everything, everything, everything I thought I had in the ashram disappeared. Nobody would speak to me. Even the other Americans who were there, there weren't many, wouldn't speak to me. And um, um, nobody would speak to me. And even in the back gate, the save it all wouldn't let me in most days. And I went from feeling like I had 100% of Swami's attention to feeling like I had none. But in the meantime, I had this ticket I couldn't change, and um, I was stuck there. And um, I wandered around Prashanti for months, feeling, oh, and Swami also had given a japa mala, which he took away that day, or the next darshan, I think, he took it away from me. And uh, I, I felt like everything had been taken away. And um, he had given me cloth to make a shirt, and when I went to make the shirt, they told me there wasn't enough cloth to make the sleeves. You know, is that it was like <laughs> he gave me everything, and then I had nothing, and um, even the shirt I couldn't wear. They gave it to me with no sleeves and said, "We can't finish it." <laughs> um, so I still have that shirt <laughs> as a reminder <laughs> of what happens when my when I get too big for the for the clothes Swami's given me. Um, so, uh, but what happened is that um, I stayed because I had no choice. And after a while, after about a month of wandering around crying every day during darshan because they wouldn't let me into the, the Sai Kuan Hall, one old lady, permanent resident in the ashram, took pity on me and she spoke to me. Nobody had spoken to me for months. Nobody. And um, she said, I see you walking around crying every day. 
I don't think you understand what's really happening here. And I said, I said, that's why I'm gonna, he's not talking to me. She said, you don't understand. He's manipulating thousands and thousands and thousands of people right now to give you exactly the experience you need. He's giving you more personal attention now than you ever got when he was walking around in Darshan. Um, he's tailored this entire experience for you. And um, that made me feel happy for a little bit. And um, I, I got very happy. I wrote Swami a nice letter. <laughs> I used to write Swami a lot of letters. I wrote him a nice letter saying, I, now I understand what you're doing, blah, 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 blah. And the next day, um, I was in the canteen eating, and um, someone came to me, a man came and got me, and he said, um, you have to come right away. Madam wants to see you. I didn't know who that was. And um, uh, he took me to a flat that belonged to one of the trustees. And a woman was there and she said, my husband's a trustee, blah, 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 blah. I had an interview with Swami today. He told me to take you to Bangalore. Um, and that made me very happy that Swami um, uh, had at least talked about me to someone else and said something nice, apparently. So she took me to Bangalore. I stayed in their house. And um, she said, Swami wants you to take a class called Reiki. So she and I went and took this class together. And um, she said, oh, there's some, well, there's a lot of the story, but I won't go into it. But very briefly, she said, um, there's this other guru in town today, and um, we're going to go see her. And her name is Amrita Nandamai Ma. And um, so this lady was a VIP everywhere she went. And so we, when we got to this huge stadium in Bangalore where there were more than 100,000 people waiting, um, at the, in the middle of the night, it was midnight or one in the morning when we went, um, th there was a line that was like 17 days long to see this woman. But we walked right to the front. And uh, when this fat lady looked at me, she said, where did you come from? Exactly the same words Baba had asked me. Where did you come from? And um, I said, I came from Baba. And she said, oh, Baba, he's like the sun, and I'm the moon. I only reflect his light. And, um, and then she got down from the place where she was sitting, and she got in the car we had come in and drove with us to this lady's house, um, where she blessed the house. And um, she didn't speak, apparently didn't speak much English, but um, that was all she said to me. But I suddenly went from feeling so cold and sad. The other thing that had happened during all that time is I was crying every day. And Swami used to say, when the, when the father won't give you what you want, ask the mother. Because the mother can never say no to her children when they're suffering. So I'd been praying every day for the Divine Mother to come and um, you know, make me happy again. And she did. And, um, and then we got a phone call. Swami's coming to Whitefield. And um, this trustee and his wife had a, had a house behind the gates in Whitefield. So right next to Swami's house. Um, and so we went there. And the save it all there didn't know me. And nobody there knew that I was forbidden from <laughs> coming to Darshan. And so suddenly, I, uh, you know, because these people were um, in a good position, they wrote me a slip and I got front row seating in every day. And Swami came to me every day and spoke to me every day. And it was like everything was given back to me. And um, what happened is that one of the people from our Manhattan Center was running a hospital in Bangalore at the time. And um, Swami told him to hire me to work in the hospital. And um, it was the hospital, at, before the super, special, super Speciality Hospital had opened, it was where they would send all of the people from the ashram who got really sick. Um, at the time I was there, uh, Colonel Joga Rao was staying in the hospital very often for a few months. And um, I had, uh, had all these years of horrible experiences in India where I opened a business and um, didn't get to go for darshan very often, and then Sai people would come and rescue me, and um, I don't know, I, I felt it was always this game, like I'm so close to Swami, and then he would keep me really far away, so close to Swami, but you're forbidden from entering the ashram. During that time, every night I had this dream that I was standing at the Ganesh gate with my suitcase, and the guards had a photo of me in the guard booth, that's, and it said, do not admit, <laughs> my photo, and I could see Swami in my dream on the you know, balcony of Purnachandra laughing and pointing at me, like laughing, <laughs> and uh, the guards not letting me in. So it's always, it's always been this experience, I've come really close, but you know, go away now. And um, how much suffering that induced in me, I have no idea what my karma is that required that, 
um, kind of suffering and humiliation. And <laughs> no. uh, but somehow I kept coming back. And um, about four years later, um, I started having a dream. Uh, I'd come back to New York and I'd, I was working in an internet company and um, I was working in the internet branch of a TV company and um, I started having a dream that Swami was saying, come and teach internet, whatever that means, at my college. So I flew to the ashram, I went to see Swami, I, I gave him a letter saying what I wanted to do. He took the letter, so I went, I made an appointment with the chancellor and I went to ask to teach classes. Um, and the chancellor laughed at me basically and said, you have to have an MBA to teach here. And um, I don't know why, but um, so I went back to Swami and said, Swami, he told me I have to have an MBA. And Swami said, go to school. So I said, Swami, what's, what's, it, this is just in Darshan, not, I didn't have an interview. And um, I said, Swami, I don't know, he said MBA. And Swami said, I'm going to make you do it. So um, I started giving Swami lists of schools. And every day he came to me in Darshan and he said, the only purpose of education is character development. Um, so one of the schools I'd heard about was in India. And um, uh, so I went there a school with a lot of American faculty, very famous school in India for business. And um, I made an interview. I took the train from Puttaparthi. I got to the school. I had an interview with some, um, one of the professors. And he said, why do you want to go to business school? And I said, I told him my story about Swami and <laughs> wanting to work in my guru's ashram, which is not what you should say when you interview at a business school. <laughs> and um, it really isn't. And uh, he threw me out. So I went to another school, second most famous school in India. I thought I was going to live in India and, and commute to the ashram or something. And um, second school, I, I told them, you know, I would, told them the truth too. And the guy said, the only purpose for a business school education is to make a lot of money for yourself and others. Um, and I thought, well, that's not what Swami said. So um, I came back to America feeling a little disappointed. And um, a friend one of our Sai sisters had gotten a job teaching at a university in Pennsylvania. And she asked me if I would help her uh, go there and set up her office. She had a lot of bookcases and books and boxes. And over Christmas break, um, we drove there and I, I was helping her set up everything. And when we drove up to the business school, there's a huge entry gate and written in metal letters over the top of the entry gate that looks exactly like the Ganesh gate in Prashanti. It says the only purpose of education is character development. and um, I thought, oh, maybe this is where I'm supposed to go to school. It was Villanova University, and um, a Catholic university on the main line outside of Philadelphia. And um, uh, you know how things work with Swami. That weekend, the, it was, the school was actually closed, but the dean of the business school was there. And um, I told him my story about Swami and going to business schools in India and what the business schools had said to me. And uh, he invited me to his house for Christmas. And on the next day, he gave me an invitation letter to join the school, and I started a week later, two weeks later, when they reopened. And um, you know how Swami makes things happen. So um, as soon as I graduated from business school two years later um, with my MBA, I had no idea what to do. Um, I went back to Puttaparthi to ask Swami. I hadn't been there in a couple of years. and. Um, And what happened then is, this was 2006. Swami said to me, time is getting very short now. Why are you wasting these precious years that are left um, chasing money and reputation and fame? Um, every day with me is a precious time for you. And um, so I just decided to move to Prashanti. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and I did. Um, so for six months out of the year, I would go to India um, and live in the ashram. And um, for six months, I would come back to New York and kind of work. And I made a lot of money doing almost nothing for some years, enough that I could live very, very comfortably in India and still pay all my bills here. So um, each year when I went, Swami gave me some kind of service project to do in the ashram. And during that time, I, I had, I don't know, so many amazing experiences, but I... I think what I should focus on in the time that's left, who knows what time it is? I can't actually see. Oh, okay, good. Um, so I'll tell you a couple of experiences that happened then, since I have 25 minutes. Um, 
So I lived in the apartment of one of our New York devotees. Swami had given her an apartment in the ashram. And she, um, she let me live there. And of course, I wanted it to be really nice. It had cement floors and cement walls and a light bulb hanging from the ceiling. So I, I spent the first year renovating the apartment and making it really modern and putting in things like dishwashers. And, <laughs> uh, you know, I made it really beautiful. But what happened during that time is that to do all this work, I had to give Swami letters every day because, of course, no one in the ashram wanted me to do the things I was doing and no one would give me permission to do it. So every day I would give Swami a letter saying, I want to do this, and they won't let me do it. And then the next day they would let me do it. And then every day it would be a new thing. So every day I was going to Swami with my request, going to Swami with my um, obstacles. And the next day the obstacles were removed. This is not really about whether you should put a marble floor in your apartment. This is about um, opening up. It's about trusting um, on a new level. It's about getting constant proof every day. Most of my story for me is about getting constant proof every day that I am not the center of my universe. Um, and that there is a power greater than me that can make things happen. So, um, the second year I went back to the ashram and had a really lovely apartment to stay in. And um, I had this really mean neighbor who hated me. I don't know why she hated me. And every day she was trying to find ways to get me out of the ashram. She would go and talk to this or that official and they'd come and say, you're not supposed to be here, you've been here more than 30 days, blah, 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 blah. I'd go to Swami with my letters. Again, I'd go to the courier and send it immediately to Swami. And um, the next day Swami would say something to me in darshan. And the next day there'd be a plate of food coming from Swami's house. It's every time, every time I surrender my problems to him, I not only get the solution, but I get <laughs> bonus prizes too. And um, he gave me that experience again and again and again. Um, but along with that are tests. So um, the very first time I'd been in the ashram, I fell in a sewer and <laughs> nearly drowned like those open sewers with the cement blocks over them, I fell through one and almost drowned. And Swami said in Darshan the next day, if, if you hadn't had this accident here, you would have been hit by a car and killed in America. Um, so I was able to take away the karma by um, giving you a small accident here where I could send help. Um, so in the ashram, uh, the second year I stayed, I got very, very sick. I got a horrible ear infection. And I went to the general hospital and they gave me some expired medicine um, that I put in my ear that caused all the skin to peel off from inside my ear. And then um, they gave me another medicine I was allergic to. And with each step I got more and more sick. And um, uh, they finally admitted me. I had lost all my hearing in my right ear. I was really sick. I hadn't eaten for weeks because I could only, because of the medicine they gave me, I was vomiting constantly. It was the wrong medicine. And um, uh, I hadn't been able to go to Darshan for days. And um, um, they took me to the hospital in the middle of the night in the ambulance, and um, because I was, I couldn't, I was at the point where I couldn't even crawl across the floor. I was like almost dead, I felt like. And um, I went into that hospital, um, probably a very demanding and very pushy foreigner. And um, I don't know, something really beautiful happened out of that experience. Um, I let go a little bit more than I ever had before so that Swami um, could work through the people around me. I'm sorry, I don't know. I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to say is that before I always wanted things my way. And when I was laying in that hospital bed really sick, it for the first time in my life became okay for it to not be my way, um, but for it to just happen um, with the trust that Swami was taking care of everything and working through everyone for my benefit. Um, and so I surrendered completely to Swami and after five days they let me out of the hospital and I was able to go to Darshan and Swami gave me Vibhuti and um, uh, the next day my ear was almost healed and um, so what happened that time is that um, I was staying in this room and had a garden under the window and there was a dog outside bleeding everywhere from its ear and all these ladies were like yelling and screaming and chasing the dog. We've got, to, we've got to save this dog. They were putting out bowls of milk and cookies and food. And um, the ladies were screaming, someone's got to take the dog to the hospital. You've got to take the dog to the hospital. So um, there was nobody to take the dog to the hospital. So I um, 
you know, wearing my beautiful white darshan clothes, I picked up the dog and I carried it to the street and I got a rickshaw and I took it to the animal hospital. And um, um, you know, I got there covered in blood. And um, when the doctor finally washed off the dog, she found that it was just a tiny little nick in the dog's right ear, but it, was, it wouldn't stop bleeding. And she said, oh yeah, little things in the ear hurt so much and they bleed so much, but it's really nothing. And, um, you know, I'd just been in the hospital for five days. This horrible, like my ear was constantly bleeding because the, all the skin had peeled off the inside and I had a horrible infection. The pillow was like bloody and yellow and disgusting every day. And, um, you know, here I was taking this dog to a hospital in India I mean, nobody in India is going to pick up a dog and carry it to a hospital, but um, some crazy foreigner. And uh, here I was with this dog, with this tiny, tiny, tiny little cut in its ear that wouldn't stop bleeding, that had made, you know, all these ladies in the ashram, you know, run around like crazy trying to get help. And um, when I got, you know, on the way back to the ashram, the dog vomited all over me. I, <laughs> they wouldn't let me back in the ashram with the dog because they don't really want dogs in the ashram. And I had to pick it up and carry it through the gate. And, um, you know, I changed my clothes and I went straight for Darshan. And Swami walked past me in Darshan and he just went like this. Um, a reminder that what feels huge to me is so little from another perspective. And um, from that day on, every day in Darshan when Swami would come, I would close my eyes. And um, he had said something to me about... Um, not looking at the form. So I started closing my eyes every day when he would come. And um, I started having these funny little visions. Um, I would see myself looking up at Swami as if I was on his foot or on his robe um, or on the edge of his chair. And um, and, and also during that time, he gave me... Uh, front row seat again and um, a, a good a really good project in the ashram and um, he started coming to me every day and um, he started coming to me every day and saying to me um, don't think that you're looking at me realize that I'm in every cell of your body looking at you and um, so during that time, he kept going past me in his wheelchair, and he wouldn't talk to me, but he kept dripping sweat on me. I know it sounds very strange, but Swami would come and lean over me, and sweat would, he would like take a letter from someone, and sweat would drip on my face. And um, um, he didn't talk to me at all during that time anymore. He, I just kept having this strange physical experience of Swami, dripping sweat on me. And then my birthday came. And um, on the day of my birthday, I got special permission to take the tray with the you know, yellow rice and um, candies. And as Swami approached me in his chair, and he pointed to me, and they turned the chair until he was right in front of me. And just then, he leaned forward, and he sneezed all over my face. <laughs> Snot. And again, it was the same experience. The whole crowd moved away. Everyone moved far away from me. And all these people came up to me afterwards and said, oh my God, it's like you're cursed or something. Swami didn't give you the birthday blessing. He sneezed on you. This is a horrible thing. And from that day, again, like nobody would talk to me because Swami had sneezed on me at my birthday. And um, it, was, it was gross, but, um, you know, I'm not going to say no. <laughs> I won't say no to Swami for that. So, um, you know, I was very confused. And... Um, So finally, after a while, he, um, he said something to me um, that I'm always looking for the outer experience. I'm always looking for the um, elevated position. I always want to be a VIP. I always want attention. And, um, and then my experience changed again in Darshan. Um, that I could feel Swami, every time he came for darshan, I still closed my eyes, but I could feel him radiating from inside of me. Um, I could feel him radiating from, in, from, literally from inside every cell in my body during the darshan. 
And, um, and I think that's the experience I'm, I continue to have today, which is, for me, the outer experience doesn't really so much matter anymore if I'm rich or I'm poor, if I have a VIP seat or I don't get a seat at all, or they don't let me in, or everybody loves me or nobody talks to me. Um, it's all the same because I know who I am now. I'm a divine spirit in this body. I'm part of God, and God is in every cell of my body, and nothing on the outside matters anymore. It doesn't really matter if I sound good or I sound bad, if you all love me or you all hate me. Um, the interaction that happens between us has nothing to do with the words that I speak. Um, I'm getting as much from being in your presence as you may or may not get from mine because the interaction is happening on a spirit level and it has nothing to do with the words. So now as I go through my day, um, I try to just remember at every minute that I'm not the doer and that Swami is doing everything through me. God is doing everything through me and um, by whatever name you call it. And in my work, I changed my work. I stopped doing anything remotely business-like and I started doing a healing practice because I love watching people change. I love watching people find their inner truth. And um, so that's the focus of my day every day, trying to bring the principles that I learned from Swami and the Sai organization into other people's lives. I mean, I don't use Swami's name there. I don't have Swami's photo there. It's not about Swami. It's about helping people find God inside of themselves, um, finding the part of God that's always watching them from within their own minds and their own bodies. And I find for me that whenever I have a point of tension, a place where things aren't working out, it's always because I'm not recognizing the part of God um, that is inside that part of my life. And I'm not surrendering to that part of God because the minute I surrender, the solution comes. The minute I look at that part of my life that's not working and I stop pushing and I just sit and say, okay, I'm ready, give me the right thing, it always resolves. It's just like writing that letter to Swami. The minute I write it, the problem is solved. And it has nothing to do with changing any of the outside circumstances. It's entirely inside of me. It's always a message when I come up against an obstacle that something in me has to change. Something in me I've, is a belief I've held on to for years or an idea I have that just doesn't work in the current circumstances. And I have to let go. I have to overcome that barrier that I've created inside myself. Um, and that's what's... That's, I think what I understand from Swami always telling me to be the observer. Because when I really observe my life from the outside, I see all of the false ideas and beliefs I've been carrying that don't make sense um, for me today in the life I have now. So, the other thing I want to say is that um, I never knew what love was. I mean, I know what movies show about love. I know what some, you know, I know what some people say about love, but I never really understood what it was to love. Um, I mean, many of you are probably very advanced in this area, but I'm a dummy when it comes to love. Um, I'm just at the very beginning of my path with love. Um, and I don't think I would ever have come anywhere close to understanding it without Swami, because um, The, book, the first book I got about Swami, the one with the photo on it, was called The Language of the Heart. And um, every encounter I had with Swami always caused so much pain in my heart. Um, I always could feel my heart like ten, 10 sizes too big for my chest, you know, like it was going to explode when Swami would come to me. And at times when I was so far away from Swami and so far away from the ashram, I could actually feel my heart hurting like a knife was in it. And I could never really feel attached to other people. I could never really feel love for other people. I could never really feel sorry for other people. I could never, I, I couldn't even feel, you know, anything good about myself, really. And um, day by day with Swami, um, I understand what love is, and it has nothing to do with what I thought it was. It doesn't look pretty always. It doesn't feel good all the time. Um, it's just about staying open to that, whatever situation I'm in, whatever person I'm with, without any judgment. Uh, that's the other message. So I couldn't love until I stopped judging. And Swami's message has always been discernment, not judgment. And um, he taught me how to not judge anymore, how to just discern this and not that, rather than this is good and that's bad. 
And as soon as I stop judging and saying, this is bad and that's good, oh, you're a good devotee, you're a bad devotee, you're, this is a good person, that's a bad person, um, I started to feel this openness in my heart where I could just be with people and in situations, even in, alone with myself and not, um, not have any response other than this is God. Um, so when Swami came to me in Darshan every day and I could see him looking at me from within me, I suddenly started having finally this experience of seeing that in other people, um, seeing God emerging from within them. And so I said the title of this talk would be watching me watching you and or watching you watching me it's reversible um, because that's what i see now everyone i look at i see divinity looking out of them at me and i see the divinity in me looking out at them and what happens is divinity is just eye to eye with no no more judgment no more opinions um, it's like my two fingernails touching they don't care <laughs> they're just here divinity is just here it's just everywhere there's no I no longer think there's a way to do it right, that there's a way to be perfect, that there's a way, that there is anything that isn't perfect already. I no longer think there's anything for me to get. Swami said to me, there's nothing more to achieve and nothing more to attain. Um, you're already God. And since then, I don't try anymore. There's no more struggle. There's no more effort. What am, what am I going to get? Liberation? And then what? You know, where am I going to go? I'm here. <laughs> I still have to walk down the streets of Manhattan and be with the same people every day. I'm already liberated. We're all liberated. We're all perfect and divine. There's nothing about us that isn't already perfect. So, so stop judging yourselves and stop judging the people you meet and just be with them. That's the message I got from Swami. Just be with them. Just see the God in them and see the God in yourself. I have, I have to see it in myself even more because... That's where I have trouble seeing divinity. Um, and then it's all the perfect experience of God everywhere you go. Oh, I think that's what I have to say for today. Thank you. <laughs> Should I answer that here? It has nothing to do with Swami. I mean, uh, repeat the question, oh, she, uh, I think the question is, what is Reiki? It's a Japanese uh, energy healing art that I practice. Uh, sorry, I missed. What year, the first the, the year when you found out about Baba? 1993. 1996. 93. 20 years ago. Speak in the microphone for the recording. Oh, sorry. Um, how long did it take you to realize whenever you needed to know that it was not about yourself, like that you didn't need that attention? Was it just kind of a click or was it a process? There's so much I didn't tell you. Um, <laughs> we, we have a conversation. We can so uh, f up until about two years ago, I'd been living in the ashram and working on a, something called the Pigeon Project, which was a project to deter pigeons from sitting in the Sai Kulwant Hall on all the chandeliers and in all the columns. Um, and um, somewhere near the end of that project, one day I got to my... <laughs> I, had, I had decided that I was going to live permanently in the ashram and become a permanent resident. So one day in Darshan, I... Uh, I'd been giving Swami letters for a few years asking for this, and one day in Darshan I got the bright idea that I was supposed to give him my passport. So <laughs> I wrote a, a very impassioned appeal to Swami um, asking for permission to stay permanently and to have my job converted to permanent staff and uh, to have a room in the ashram permanently. And um, I, gave it, I gave the letter with my passport in Darshan. And... Um, <laughs> And uh, a few days later, I came back to my room, and there was a lock on the door. And 
<laughs> I went to the uh, accommodations office and said, I don't know what's going on. My room is locked. And they said, oh, we have a package for you from Swami. Um, <laughs> and it was my passport and my uh, letter returned, both of them. Um, and with a note to report to Mr. Unikrishnan. So I went to Unikrishnan and he said, you have to leave the ashram immediately and don't ever come back. You're being blacklisted. <laughs> and um, um, and from, from then until the time I left, the people you don't even know in the ashram, the, the security officers um, who are invisible most of the time, escorted me around the ashram as I collected my things and packed my bags. And it was with immense shame. I felt this overwhelming, almost like fire in my body as they escorted me through the ashram back to my room to pack my bags. And all I could see was my feet. I was just looking down at my feet. And um, at that moment, my eyes filled with a vision of Swami's feet. And I had never understood this Indian obsession with worshiping the feet before. But at that moment, all I could see in my mind was Swami's feet. And I was just saying over and over again, I surrender at your feet, give me whatever is right for me. You know better than me. I'd been through this enough times with Swami, um, having everything taken away again, that I know he knows what's right and that there's absolutely nothing that happens in Prashanti that he's not orchestrating. Nothing anyone says is without um, you know, his control. So as they had just finished telling me I was being blacklisted for life and that I should pack my bags and never come back, um, all I could see was Swami's feet and I was just saying, Swami, it's, it's up to you, you decide everything. If this is the right thing, I'll do it. Um, and uh, I went back to my room and I packed and they escorted me out of the ashram. And um, um, I was so lost and confused, I had no idea what to do. And during that time I had a cell phone and I had, you know, I'd been working there for a while so I knew a lot of people, I knew a lot of um, the people who I thought could help me in the ashram. Of course, not, nobody can help you but Swami there especially. So I was calling all these people, but it was January and it was the time after sports day when all the people in the ashram who live there go away for a vacation because um, it's still cool in all of South India and um, it's a nice time to travel. So nobody was there to help me. I was all alone and all I had was Swami and I just completely surrendered to his feet and um, I don't know. It was also that experience of the heart opening. It was like um, I'm not in control anymore and it's okay. I let go. Do whatever you have to do. And, um, and of course we found out you know, two months later that Swami was not going to stay much longer and that he was in the hospital. And thank God he didn't keep my passport because the next step would have been them submitting it and I would have to wait like two or three years before I could have a permission to leave India. So I would have been trapped there in the ashram and um, at a time when I really didn't want to be there. I mean, I wouldn't have wanted to stay there, I think, after Swami um, made his transition. Um, so it was my reason, it was my motive, you know, it was because he had said this time is so precious, why waste even a day? Why are you in New York chasing fame and reputation when you could be here working for me? And without him there, there's no reason I should be in New York, um, you know, carrying his light to the other people around me. So, so that's why I'm here now and, and I understand now why he sent my passport back. And I'll say incidentally that Right, the, day, the, the morning I woke up and heard that Swami had died, I had a dream that morning. For years I'd always asked Swami for two things, make me a permanent resident and give me a ring. Um, <laughs> and uh, neither of which he did while he was alive. But the morning he died, the morning uh, he was already, he had already died during the night, but the morning I um, woke up and heard that he was dead, I just had a dream that I was on a bus with Swami and um, he gave me a ring. And he said, now you're ready to become a permanent resident in my ashram. And um, um, I don't know, that's sort of, it was such a nice culmination. It was like, it was horrible months, horrible months after he, you know, literally threw me out and said, don't ever come back. And they did put up that picture <laughs> saying, do not admit. <laughs> and I was there. And um, um, they took my photo in the security office and uh, put it up on the wall. And... Um, you know, I wandered around India for two months because I, I, I still had a, I couldn't leave exactly. Um, so I wandered around India going to holy pilgrimage places and calling all the people in the ashram who I thought could help me saying, help me. And the day I flew back to Bangalore to get uh, my flight to the US, um, I got a call from the trustee um, saying, 
Swami wants to know where you are and why you left. <laughs> It's like six hours before I was supposed to go to the airport. And I said, uh, you know why I left. And he, Swami threw me out. And the guy said, well, he wants you to come back right away. Can you come right now? And um, so I, I said, no, you know, my, I have to be at the airport at 8 tonight. And it's already, you know, it was 4 or something by then. There's no way. My visa, and my visa expired at midnight that night. So I had to be out. And um, so there was, it was impossible. Um, so he said, he, he hung up and he called me back in a while and says, Swami says, okay, you come back for his next birthday. So I got, every time I've been totally denied everything by Swami, there's always been the reprieve later on. You know, someone comes and says, Swami wants you to do this, after he's already thrown me out. Swami wants you to come back. You know, so I, so I left the experience feeling like um, all the fear and panic and pain is inside of me. It, it's not real. It has nothing to do with reality. Um, so I can just let Swami have all of that. Any other questions? One last question. How did you learn to eliminate judgment? Because you said that's something you've done, but even the split second snap judgments that make us human. That happens a thousand times a day. The difference is that in my mind today, those, those kinds of judgments arise constantly every time somebody steps on my toe or takes the seat I was about to sit in in the subway. Um, but they no longer have any power. They no longer have, um, there's no sting. It's like a, like a bee without a stinger. You hear the buzz, but there's no more impact. There's no more, I think a lot of people who've been here for a while know what I mean. There's no more power behind that thought. It's just a, a random thought that passes. Because the second thought is, that person probably needs that seat more than me. She must be tired. She must not be feeling well. There's a thought of compassion that follows immediately after that negates whatever the negative thought was. That person who just yelled at me, oh, they must be afraid. Because today I know from my own experiences with Swami that almost every bad thing I've ever done in my life has been done because of fear. So now when I see other people doing things, um, that are, you know, that don't feel good to me. It's usually because they're afraid. Um, we're all suffering. We're all desperately trying to not hurt. <laughs> and so most of the things people do that, that grate on me are because they're afraid or they're hurting or they're scared. And um, so there's this thought of compassion that negates whatever negative thought I might have. But I think practicing that longer and longer, now even most of the time the negative thought doesn't come. It just... I just see it. I just observe it. It's just something that happens and I no longer, my head doesn't move into that space, but it's a long practice. It took me years to do it. I always told people it's like um, training a dog not to jump up on a sofa. Um, you know, the first, the first week you decide the dog's not going to get up on the sofa anymore, you have to scream at it a hundred times. Get down, bad dog, don't get up there anymore. Then after you've done it for a few weeks, the dog comes into the room and kind of looks at you and looks at the sofa and tries to decide if it's going to get yelled at. And it tries it a few times. Then f after a few more weeks or a month or two, the dog lays down on the other side of the room but kind of looks at the sofa, you know? He doesn't try to get up there, but he still looks. Finally, after about three or four or five months of vigilance, one day the dog just comes in the room and curls up in another corner and doesn't even look at the sofa. And that's how it is with my mind. Um, if I'm really vigilant and I practice really hard at not um, judging, not thinking, not even... Judging requires thinking about other people thinking about their actions, thinking about their words. If I, if I just choose not to think about it, it's like training the dog not to jump up on the sofa. If I'm not thinking about that person in an evaluative way, then eventually there's just no more, it, there's no more reaction from the brain that it's going to think that. It's, gonna, it's not going to do it because I'm not thinking anymore. So every time I see it thinking, I have to pray, God, please take away this thinking. Please stop me from thinking like that. It's especially hard if someone hurts your feelings or says something mean to you. Then... Um, then I have to keep telling my brain, stop thinking. I do not want you to think about this. I don't want you to judge that person. I don't want you to um, um, go there. It's, n it's none of your business. It's none of my business what I think about other people. And it's also none of my business what I think about myself. It just is worthless. What I think about anyone or anything is absolutely worthless. Um, finally, the next step is every time my mind does start thinking, I pick up the phone and call someone I know who's sick or suffering or unhappy and I just say, hey, I was thinking about you. How are you doing? 
And by the time they're done telling me about all their problems, I'm not thinking anymore about myself. So, I mean, those are my little tricks for how I stop thinking and how I stop judging, but that's what I do. And even now, if something happens that really upsets me, I have to go back to those same tools and get my mind silent again. Because once it's silent, I can go months without, literally months without a thought. Um, but once it gets in the habit of thinking, Swami always told the story of tying the monkey to the stick, right? You, cl you train the monkey to climb up the stick and you train it to climb down the stick. And each time it climbs, it, it's got a rope on, so it can't go very far. But eventually, after it's gone up and down the stick enough times, he says you do it through Namasmarana. So by all means, do that. Um, you can take the rope off and the monkey won't go anywhere. It'll just keep climbing up the stick and down the stick. And that's what I do with my mind, is just train it to go up and down the stick without going anywhere else. Okay, thank you, Sairam. <laughs>